tell them your name. <laughs> okay. All right. <laughs> okay. We are rolling. Are we rolling, Bob? We are um, rolling. Uh, yeah. Okay. I'm uh, Roberta Spalter Roth, and today is November 11th. No? 15th. 15th, see? None of us remember anything. Uh, 2016. Okay. And I'm Roger Lesser, and it's the same date. <laughs> okay. Um, Bobby, uh, tell us what you do, your profession, and tell us about your experiences in Washington and the anti-war movement in the early 70s. I'm a, uh, I have a doctorate in sociology, and but I you know, have, have thought of myself primarily as a sociologist for a long, long time. Also, sort of like Bruno Bettelheim stuff on how you survive in a constant concentration camp where you study it. You're there and you experience it, but you also study it. So that's a lot of what um, I do and what I especially did then and because this was a, the women's movement was a major social movement, and so studying it as a movement and its its rituals, its patterns, its demonstrations, its interactions among people, which were not always so nice, um, were things that I both studied and experienced. Okay. Could you get your arms off the table so that the table isn't shake? Okay, perfect. Okay, Roger? Yes? Um, tell me how you met Bobby and tell me about you going to the anti-war demonstrations. Which one? Tell them about the shared experience at the anti-war demonstration. I don't remember that, but I think we met when Bobby worked on Off Our Backs with you, which was in the basement of our house. <laughs> and, so. and then I, uh, because I was, I moved with my with Peter mm -hmm. Goldstone, my first husband, uh, to Pennsylvania. I then would come down and I would stay at your house. And I lived on uh, raspberry yogurt and granola, which I kept. There was a little refrigerator in the basement, and I kept my stuff there. Later on, I stayed, I think, with Nancy Farrow and uh, Wendy Blum. But that's how. So obviously I was engaged in, in your household and occasionally would take care of uh, Tasha and uh, would go to demonstrations and uh, the one I remember is that somehow I th thought it was May Day but maybe I'm told it was not May Day. Um, and uh, Roger and I got tear gas together and we're running down the street and there is, we sat down and there's, there is a photo of us that I might be able to find. Mm -hmm. um, Roger has, do you have any recollection of that? Vaguely, it's a vague memory. Well, but I do know that from the time we moved to you in June of 1968, where we thought we didn't know anybody here and we were living on Capitol Hill right near the Capitol, across from the Library of Congress Jefferson building. And I was working at the Department of Health, Education, and Welfare and would walk to work every day down the hill. I've heard that. And then we got involved, we were involved in every demonstration during that period, which there were a lot of them. And our daughter Natasha used to play on the Capitol grounds We'd walk over there and she would play. And eventually we realized there were people we didn't know, Marilyn Webb, who was also involved in Off Our Backs. She lived in the next building from me when I went to graduate school at the University of Chicago. And Norma then got involved with the women's movement, with consciousness raising groups and with uh, Off Our Backs one of the first and longest surviving women's feminist newspapers in the United States. But I don't remember that specific day. I do remember May Day very well because a friend of ours, Ellen Bravo, who started 9 to 5, was a 
professor at St. Mary's College and brought a whole lot of students to our house in uh, Washington, D.C. And our daughter, Natasha, who was then, how old was she? Was she two years old, got very upset because her house was in chaos. So I was going to go out in the streets, but I decided not to because she was so upset. And all the people I knew from that period, uh, Rob Burledge and other people were walked outside the house and were quickly arrested and sent to the holding pan at Kennedy Stadium. I also remember that, you know, I also sort of had some, when I lived, because I was commuting between um, Pennsylvania and D.C., um, I remember having a, uh, the Black Panthers were holding some sort of con Adventure. Of event. Yeah. And so we had huge numbers of people. I think we were still living in Bluebell. And I have, in, in the notebook I gave, I, I have, you know, I have stories about, you know, who did the cooking and, you know, what we ate. And, because uh, you had to have a big pot of soup. Oh, I was very into making stock at that point. And so I always had stock to make soup and muffins. And so that was my, my demonstration hostess repertoire. <laughs> and I was at that too. It was the, I had been to the Philadelphia Convention and the Black Panther Party, and then I went to the one in Washington. I think there was one somewhere else, maybe in Oakland, California, that I wasn't at. And uh, all the Black Panthers and the women and the men were all wearing black berets and you know, it was sort of the peak of their militants before. They all got killed. They, yeah, many of them got killed or arrested, arrested and uh, many others. And, you know, that started out as a kind of social services agency, helping to feed children and edu educate black children. But they became more and more militant, and uh, a lot of them were carrying guns in those days. But as it turned out, they might have had a need to because the FBI had planted people in the organization to try to, you know, overthrow them or to uh, get them to do things that would <laughs> that would uh, enable the FBI and the Justice Department to indict them. I remember we had. This diary, this document from some woman who went underground. At all for bucks? In your house. We had Joanne, I can't remember her name. She went underground. We had this this journal of hers. And so of course we were all sure we were gonna get invaded by the FBI. So we used to meet in a room in your house which had no windows. <laughs> And we would talk about, I forget what we called it. We couldn't call it the journal. We had sort of a code name for it that we would <laughs> Do you remember that? No, but I do remember that at one point I was out of town and the FBI came to our house looking for Kathy Wilkerson, who I really didn't mm -hmm. know. But she did, I think, live on the next block from us. And they thought somehow I knew her. And when Norma told me, them, I wasn't home because Norma told me later they kicked in one of the glass panes in our front mm -hmm. door. Hmm. Yeah, I can't remember what we called it. And maybe I'll find the notebook where I wrote about it, but it was really quite hysterical. I mean, Rob Burledge was there. Uh, what was the woman? Janet Simon? No, uh, the woman who uh, lived with Rob at the time. She that was, was Janet. No. Janet Simon yeah. was her name? Yeah. Because I remember she had dated Peter at Wisconsin. So. <laughs> <laughs> Janet dated everybody. <laughs> Probably. So <laughs> what, what makes Washington unique as opposed to other cities as far as the movement in those days? Because the capital is here. And so since it was a, you know, a, a war, uh, the Vietnam you know, I, I, war was a war and, and that it... Ah. 
it started, you know, it was controlled through Washington. So obviously, we people came to Washington. The same with the civil rights movement. I mean, ultimately, I was there for the March on Washington. Uh, I came down from New York. It was the summer between uh, my graduating Indiana and my starting graduate school at Wisconsin. And I mean, so that's, you know, where you came to make public statements. I don't know that the women's movement in Washington would have had a start in Washington. Obviously, it was all over the country. Um, but nonetheless, then you could easily do a twofer and do, you know, the peace movement and the women's movement in the and, same city. And I worked for the government when I first moved here in the Department of Health, then Health Education and Welfare. And with a number of other people that I still see, we were part of something called Federal Employees for a Democratic Society. And it was an incredibly boring job. I was doing statistical reports on child welfare, which seems to have stayed in my life, child welfare, throughout my career. But I lasted there a year. Thereafter, I went to work at the Institute for Policy Studies for 10 years. But the only thing that I enjoyed then is when one of the last weeks of my job, I helped to organize an anti-war demonstration among federal employees on the mall with Dr. Spock and Andy Jacobs, who was then a progressive congressman from Indiana. That's like a oddity today to think of a progressive congressman from Indiana. Mm -hmm. Well, my first job was at, was in the uh, local anti-poverty program where I worked for a number of years till we moved up to, well, till I started working on Off Our Backs. Then I left the job mm -hmm. and got unemployment. Mm -hmm. and, and then, you know, lived there till we moved to uh, Pennsylvania so Peter could teach at Temple. But uh, then I commuted every week. So, in summary, uh, what do you think we've accomplished? Today or uh, over? Well, I, I mean, I think uh, we did, I don't know. I mean, certain. I remember I wrote a manners column for Off Our Backs, and the symbol was sort of a woman sort of smelling her armpit. Um, and uh, I think, you know, actually we changed manners. If you look at how people and women dress like that. When I started working in D.C., I had these little linen dresses, mm -hmm. and I wore little low heels, mm -hmm. papagallos. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and no one dresses like that anymore, um, except maybe if you're a federal official. But... Uh, I mean, even Hillary wore pantsuits all the time. So I think that at least on some levels, we, we change daily life. Um, and, you know, and there are still the battles, garbage can to garbage can. Who in a household is going to throw out the garbage? And who's going to do the dishes? And I think those battles continue, but I think maybe they have a little bit more success. Women have a little more success. But I think their on those ongoing tensions in daily life are still there. I think we, you know, we did accomplish. I mean, now at this moment, after you know the Democrats, Hillary lost. Um, it looks like everything. You know, we're going to lose abortion rights. I mean, we're all there. I remember being at a demonstration where if you had had an illegal abortion, you would told about it. Um, like, all that's going, you know, it sounds like it's going down the tubes. And as Roger says, we're going to have to start over again in our walkers. You know, like most of my friends after the election, I was sort of in a state of shock. But, and I'm still a little bit in a state of shock because I certainly didn't expect us to elect somebody who has such negative views, I think, about people, whether it's women, minorities, uh, immigrants, uh, all people. I mean, the irony is that a lot of the people who seem to have voted for Donald Trump are white working class people who uh, feel like, and there's some truth to what feel like the society has really 
screwed with them and they used to have well-paying jobs in steel mills and auto factories and those kinds of jobs are much reduced from what they used to be and a lot of them are working in low-paying jobs and fast food restaurants and hotels. But their wives always worked in those jobs. I remember, this is years later, when I was working at the Institute for Women's Policy Research, testifying before the uh, uh, Labor Committee. Uh, Ted Kennedy chaired it, and uh, they had this panel of, of men and some women about you know, the loss of working class jobs, of those steel mill jobs. Meanwhile, sitting at the table were their wives, who were supporting them on these shitty service jobs. They've, women have always had those jobs. The fact that 30 years later, men are bemoaning that they lost these jobs. This happened in the 70s and the 80s. Mm -hmm. um, yes, I think it, you can carry anger and rage, and um, Arlie Hochschild just did a book having lived with the Tea Party people for three years. I mean, that they, they do feel like everyone's gotten ahead of them. Blacks, immigrants, and so, but, yeah. But in, in ways, I mean, their views, I sympathize with not having a decent job. I think if Trump can bring about decent jobs, that's fabulous. But it's really interesting to me that the wives of these men have always had crappy jobs mm -hmm. and uh, only got into these jobs, the, the jobs that their husbands have, when they started really moving them offshore. And it's still interesting to me that it... it probably the case that many of these people think that Trump will curtail the banks. Meanwhile, he's getting rid of Dodd-Frank. Um, so, I don't know. I mean, you have to look at social movements that it's not like they make change and then that's it. Things go back and forth and back and forth. And I hope uh, it'll happen again, that we'll sort of get back into some kind of power. And with all of my uh, kind of despair about what just happened in another way. <coughs> I think the Democratic Party, which I've been unhappy with for a long time, will hopefully be forced to make a turn to uh, work with people in a better way, whether it's working class people. I mean, I couldn't believe that Hillary Clinton lost in Michigan and in Wisconsin and in Pennsylvania and lost a lot of votes from people even who had supported Barack Obama in 2008 and 2012. So I feel like I'm being pushed, which I'm not unhappy about, to step up more and, uh, no, I, I and, think and work harder to I think to in many it. ways those were you know, very happy days. I mean, even though, you know, I was getting gas and I went to all these demonstrations and, uh, you know, uh, hardly had a lavish lifestyle. Um, in fact, um, there was a lot of positive stuff. Yeah, I well, agree with that too. Although Off Our Backs was often the seat of great struggles. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. End of interview.